we're going to talk about uh, our beautiful Santa Barbara courthouse, a one of a kind building. How did it get its design? Okay, we all know that the Santa Barbara courthouse is a beautiful building. It's one of the most distinctive courthouse structures in America. It is a landmark a symbol of the Spanish heritage of Santa Barbara. And it was designed by architects who did not win a design competition for this building. So our one of a kind courthouse, how did it get its design? During this two part seminar this week and next week, we're gonna explore two questions. First week, this first week was why was the courthouse designed in the image of Southern Spain? Next week, we're gonna talk about how did the architects actually achieve their design and why is it still important today? So let's go off with part one. This is what we'll talk about today. Why was the courthouse designed in the architectural style of Southern Spain? It all began in 1919 with a design competition to replace courthouse facilities dating all the way back to 1875. Before the current courthouse, the one that we see today, there were actually four previous courthouses in Santa Barbara. Three of them were original Spanish adobe buildings from the early days when Santa Barbara was a colony of Spain. Uh, they quickly found out the first one was uh, uh, used in 1850. It was called the Aguirre Adobe. And that, of course, is the year that California became a state and Santa Barbara became a county and they needed a place for a courthouse. So they rented this uh, adobe building, but they immediately found out it was not big enough. And even from the early days, the county courthouse uh, uh, was growing as fast as it could. The county government was growing really fast and they constantly need more space. So they moved into another uh, adobe building called the Coda Adobe. It was uh, not very satisfactory for them. So it, they only stayed there a year and they moved into a third adobe building called the Kays Adobe. And this adobe uh, building was located on the site where the courthouse currently is, which is why the courthouse is currently where it is. Well, then in 1875, uh, they decided they really needed a brand new courthouse that was much bigger and much better building than uh, the old adobe buildings. And so they uh, completed a brand new structure designed in the Victorian classical revival style. And this, went, uh, this was uh, dedicated in 1875. Uh, in 1888, they needed more space, so they added another building, uh, which was the Hall of Records for the county. And it was designed in another Victorian style called the Richardsonian Romanesque style. Uh, and this style gets its name from the fact that it uses a lot of heavy stone and a lot of round arches like Roman construction. But it was, but it still a, was a Victorian style. Well, as the county continued to grow, demand for more courthouse space continued to grow. And in 1919, after they'd been in the 1875 courthouse for about 45 years, the County Board of Supervisors initiated a design competition for an even larger but more unified facility. They didn't really want to just keep adding more buildings. And uh, I've had a chance in my career to uh, be a part of several big international design competitions. And in order to have everybody designing to the same kind of objectives, they always start off uh, uh, giving all of the participants a set of design criteria that they all need to design toward. And in the case of the courthouse, there were four of these that were really important. The first one was obviously meet all the space requirements for county services. And that meant uh, uh, courtrooms and judges chambers and jury rooms, all the office space for all the county services, they needed a uh, really nice meeting room for the County Board of uh, Supervisors to have their public meetings. They needed a law library. They needed a larger hall of records. They needed a better jail. And uh, they also wanted a large auditorium space that they could use to have big public events. So there was a lot of things involved in, in that part. Then the Board of Supervisors knew how difficult it was or how common it was for them to need to expand. And so they wanted a design that was easily expandable all within one building and not have to build multiple buildings again. They also knew how difficult it was to raise money for building new 
courthouse facilities. So they wanted the design to be cost effective. And then finally, they wanted the design to reflect the Spanish heritage of Santa Barbara. Well, this was kind of an unusual request at that time because in those days, most courthouses all over the US were being built in a Victorian classical revival style. And uh, here's some examples of it. So you can see the Santa Barbara courthouse here in the middle. And here's a couple of courthouses in uh, other counties in California. And a lot of counties in California had this type of design. And you can see they're pretty similar. And these were used all across the country, even to my hometown in Kankakee, Illinois. So uh, this was a very popular type of design. And it was based on the classical Greek architecture like you think of when you think of the Parthenon, which has big columns and a big pediment. So columns like, like this and a pediment on top and this kind of style was uh, popular all over the place. But as we all know, Santa Barbara, oh, and the reason for this was because this uh, classical Greek uh, revival style of architecture was used because it reflected back to Greek culture and Greek government. And as we all know, Greece was the birthplace of a democratic, uh, of, of Western democracies. And so this was symbolizing uh, a democracy and American government buildings did this, uh, not only courthouses, but also state houses. When you look around, you'll always see this kind of style. But in Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara started off as a Spanish colonial settlement. Uh, it was not Greek and it was not European. Uh, well, not, not English as we think of the colonies that came in. And of course, it started off with the Presidio that was founded in 1782 and the mission that was founded four years later. And the typical building in Santa Barbara was like this a picture down below. They were built out of adobe and they were long and narrow and they were used for lots of different things. Well, eventually over the next hundred years, Santa Barbara evolved from being a Spanish uh, 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 mission settlement into a real town, and it uh, began to look like all of the other towns all up and down the coast of uh, California. And the reason for that is probably because of the construction of Stern's Wharf uh, in the 1870s. And before then, it was really difficult to get into Santa Barbara. Uh, you had, if you came by ship, the ship had to anchor offshore, and you had to get into a small boat and ride the boat through the surf to the beach. And that made it really difficult for passengers and supplies to get onto the beach. And of course, the mountains were really difficult to cross too. So um, uh, uh, it was Santa Barbara did not grow very much until the wharf was built. When all of a sudden, when the wharf was built, they could bring in all kinds of supplies, including lumber from Northern California. And they started building Santa Barbara uh, to in a Victorian California style, just like all the other uh, cities up and down the coastline. So here's some examples, the original Arlington Hotel and what State Street looked like in those days. But around 1900, all across America, people were starting to uh, uh, feel pride in America. And they were kind of tired of using this very popular Victorian European style, which is really an English style of architecture. And they wanted something to express American uh, culture. And back East, people were starting to adopt uh, American colonial design, which was different from American English design. Uh, but in Florida and Texas and um, New Mexico and California, all of which were Spanish colonies, people got interested in their Spanish roots. And this led to an idea in California of looking to the missions as a way to express the Spanish history of California. And uh, this led to then an architectural style called mission revival. And what they did in Mission Revival was look to the missions and say, well, let's pick up some of the design ideas from the missions and that will make our buildings look kind of like a mission. So when they built the train station in Santa Barbara in 1902, they picked up on the uh, arcade from the Santa Barbara mission and used that arcade at the train station. A year later, uh, the very elegant Potter Hotel was completed. It was built between the train station and the beach and it was attracting people from all over uh, uh, the United States. And it was a real luxury hotel. And they picked up on the theme of the mission by using the, the two, two twin bell towers from the mission. Well, this, this style of mission revival didn't last very long because then something else happened in 1915, 
there was a big international exposition in San Diego called the Panama California International Exposition that celebrated the opening of the Panama Canal. And this was held in Balboa Park. And I'm sure that if many, if not all of you have been to Balboa Park at one time or another, and this uh, particular uh, uh, exposition, like all expositions, uh, international expositions, and these days, uh, 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 Olympic Games, the host country or the host city would design very elaborate buildings to show how sophisticated they were. So in San Diego, they picked the most elaborate Spanish style they could think of because this was celebrating Panama and the Western uh, uh, Spanish uh, New World, uh, including California. And they picked this uh, uh, Balboa, uh, um, actually Spanish Baroque style of architecture, which is really elaborate. And, and this kind of style is really beautiful and all of us really like it, but it's way too expensive and way too elaborate to be practical. But in the end, it got everybody excited about Spanish architecture and that's what made Spanish architecture very popular in California. But Santa Barbara already had a Spanish self-image from its very beginning. Santa Barbara has celebrated holidays and special events with Spanish musicians and dancers and writers. And of course, we do it every year with Fiesta and we, we send uh, our writers down to the Rose Parade every year. And so Santa Barbara is known for this kind of an image. Well, this identity was reinforced by other events, including the 1876 centennial celebrations for the Santa Barbara mission. And people got really interested in Spanish history. Then a few years later, there was a really popular novel written by Helen Hunt Jackson in 1884 that romanticized the whole Spanish colonial image of mission life in California, and in particular at the mission at Santa Barbara. Then, of course, we all know that ever since the mid 18th century, the Casa de la Guerra, which was the home of the commandant of uh, the third or fourth Spanish uh, commandant of the Spanish Presidio at Santa Barbara, his name was Jose Antonio de la Guerra y Noriega. Uh, this house uh, had served as the center of social influence and power in Santa Barbara. Uh, and Jose uh, Antonio de la Guerra married. Uh, uh, a woman, Maria Carrillo, which was another famous um, Spanish family here. And so between the two families, everybody would go to this house for all of the events and all the political action. And so this was a really important house. Well, late in the 19th and early 20th century, uh, there were some problems uh, because cities in America were starting to industrialize and they were starting to grow really rapidly. And as they grew, uh, they pulled in a lot of workers and they built a lot of factories and things got really crowded and things got really polluted and things got uh, really dangerous in these cities. And this was a real uh, uh, difficult situation. When, well, there were two reactions to this. And one was that the people who were wealthy enough uh, would go out into the countryside and build country homes to get away from all the noise and the pollution and the crime. And one of the places they came to was Santa Barbara, where they built country homes up in Montecito. Um, other people went to other places. But one of the things that happened in the late 19th century was the Chicago World's Fair called the World's Columbian Exposition, which celebrated the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus discovering America. And uh, they, like San Diego, uh, wanted to do a real elaborate, extravagant uh, design that would get everybody excited about the fair. And they picked up on an idea uh, called the City Beautiful Movement. And this City Beautiful Movement was the other reaction to what to do with these terrible problems in the cities. And that was the people uh, who were interested in this tried to establish a reform movement that would say, if we could just make cities more beautiful, uh, and we added parks and we added lakes and we built nicer buildings, then people would be happier in the cities and maybe the crime rate would go down. So at the Chicago World's Fair, they designed the most beautiful complex of uh, exhibition buildings that they could think of. And this was done in the Victorian style, but they added lakes and ponds and parks. And then they painted the entire fairgrounds, all the buildings bright white. And everybody was just completely excited about this. And it was called the White City. 
and uh, they thought this was a really great idea. Well, at the same time, there was a very famous art and architecture school in Paris called the Ecole de Beaux Arts, and uh, that's that translates in English as the School of Fine Arts, and they had come up with a uh, design philosophy, a teaching philosophy for art and architecture that uh, said essentially, if you study historic architecture and historic buildings and, and historic cultures really carefully and you learn a lot from them, particularly in the case of architecture, and you copied all the great images of designs from any historic buildings that were really beautiful, like the pyramids or, or like uh, the uh, temples in Greece or like the buildings in Rome, and you just adopted them to new buildings, uh, then your new building has to be beautiful too. That was the concept. I'm not sure how great that was, but that's what they were thinking about. Well, and uh, so that led to a city beautiful movement all across the United States. And in 1909, the Civic League of Santa Barbara, a group of leading citizens, hired a city beautiful design expert from the University of Illinois named Charles Robinson to create a concept for beautifying the town. They all had, the wealthy people in Santa Barbara had beautiful homes up in Montecito and up, uh, up out, out sort of on the edge of town, but uh, they didn't really like the way the Victorian downtown looked like in Santa Barbara and they wanted to do something about that. Well, Charles, Rob, Charles Robinson came up with a number of uh, recommendations, but uh, four of them are really important to what would happen to the future of Santa Barbara. And the first one was save the waterfront. Don't let anybody build any big buildings on the waterfront, no big hotels, no big entertainment complexes, no big houses, leave the beach open to the people and open to the view. That was really important. And this is why Santa Barbara has a gorgeous beach here. The second thing was treat the mission and the Casa de la Guerra, the two most important buildings in Santa Barbara at the time as landmarks, turn them into historic centers. Then, create a civic center plaza right at the Costa de la Guerra in the center of downtown. Uh, this would tie right in with the uh, historic uses of the Costa de la Guerra and would become the center place for all activities in Santa Barbara. Then finally, unify the visual image along the primary street, which is State Street, that connects the beach to the downtown, to the Casa de la Guerra, and then all the way out to the mission. So these were important factors that would affect the future of Santa Barbara. Well, Pearl Chase got interested in the City of Beautiful movement. Uh, she graduated from Berkeley in 1909, and she came back to Santa Barbara, and she looked around, and she says, well, I don't really like the way Santa Barbara looks very much either. We've got to beautify this place. And she became a really strong advocate for planting trees, particularly street trees, and saving a lot of the old adobe buildings, which were all starting to get old and starting to fall apart. And a lot of people were just tearing them down. She wanted to save them as historic buildings and she was very successful with that. Then there were a bunch of people, a number of people who came to Santa Barbara uh, in, the, in the next few years who were really important to what would happen in Santa Barbara. In 1913, an investment banker from San Francisco named George Batchelder came to Santa Barbara to retire. He was like a lot of other wealthy people. Uh, he just really liked Santa Barbara and the ambiance and he built a country home here. Well, he decided uh, not to retire and he got interested in the opportunity to build a residential project in the foothills up above Santa Barbara Mission that would look like a Mediterranean village. And he thought if he could just create this image that it would be really picturesque and really pleasant and he could really sell land and sell houses. Uh, and he wanted a really strong vision for his village. So he called it the Riviera and that is how the Riviera got started in Santa Barbara. Then he made everyone who bought and built a, a home site from him and built a house in the Riviera, made them all painted uh, like Mediterranean buildings with white stucco walls and red tile roofs. So that started the whole uh, notion of what Santa Barbara might look like. Then in 1917, an artist came to Santa Barbara. His name was George Washington Smith. You may have heard of him. He uh, started off uh, studying architecture at Harvard. He uh, couldn't afford to stay in school, so he went into to the bond market, became a bond trader, made a lot of money, and then went off to Europe to study art and architecture. He didn't study at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, but he studied at another really good school, and then he spent his free time traveling all over Europe, looking at all the art and architecture. 
I did the same thing when I was in architecture school. I got a job in Greece and then I traveled all over Europe looking at all the art and architecture. Uh, it's a really good way to learn. Uh, but he had enough. But after, after all of that, he uh, had a friend in Santa Barbara who said, why don't you come to Santa Barbara? This is a good place for artists. So he came here and he had enough money from working in the bond market to build himself a house in Santa Barbara and a studio for his artwork. And he tried to make it as an artist here. But people saw his house, which he designed like a Spanish farmhouse from Andalusia in Southern Spain, because he was in an area where people were building country homes in Montecito. And the people around saw this house and said, wow, this is a really beautiful house. I, can you design one for us? And he became an architect, gave up his artist career and became an architect, the most probably the most famous architect in Santa Barbara. And he designed dozens and dozens of houses in Santa Barbara, all of which are very sought after these days. Uh, and, and the building on the left, El Hogar, is, is, was his house. And the building on the right is an example of houses that he's, he's done. Well, in 1919, Bernard Hoffman, an electrical engineer from Massachusetts, and his wife Irene came to Santa Barbara so that their daughter could be treated for diabetes. And they found Dr. Sansom. So they decided to stay here for a while while their daughter was under treatment, and uh, they got interested in Santa Barbara. Meanwhile, that same year, a group of leading citizens, citizens in Santa Barbara started to see the same thing that George Batchelder did, that there was opportunity for tourism in Santa Barbara and opportunity for land development, and they wanted to attract tourists. So they formed an organization called La Primavera Association, which uh, translates into the Springtime Association, and they wanted to create a Spanish style spring festival in Santa Barbara to promote tourism and attract people who maybe were wintering over in other places in California and catch them on their way back to their hometowns elsewhere in the United States. Well, this was really successful, but it was a single event. Well, eventually over the next couple of years, the event evolved into Fiesta, and we all know about Fiesta, and it moved from the springtime to the summer and now Fiesta is held every year in August. And the group that formed this, La Primavera Association, became the Community Arts Association. Well, the Community Arts Association, uh, its membership were all the leading citizens, citizens in Santa Barbara. And both Pearl Chase and Bernard Hoffman joined up because this was sort of the place to be. And there was a lot of social influence in this town. And it was focused primarily on art, music, and theater. But uh, Bernard Hoffman and Pearl Chase would add another dimension to that organization. Well, then in 1920, a Scottish architect named James Osborne Craig designed a country home in Montecito, again, like George Washington Smith, to look like an Andalusian farmhouse from southern Spain. He uh, came here uh, kind of in an unusual way by way of, of Colorado Springs and uh, uh, Arizona, but he came here and he got a job working as an architect on the restoration of the mission at Santa Inez. And he learned in this project all about authentic, historic California Spanish mission design. And uh, after he finished working on that, he tried to open it, uh, and a practice here as an architect and he wasn't getting very many projects, but he eventually was able to uh, restore the Orania Adobe, which is on De La Guerra Street, and turn it into an architecture office. Then Bernard Hoffman and his wife, who had fallen in love with the Spanish character of Santa Barbara and decided they wanted to build a house here, uh, uh, Irene started asking around all of her friends, do you know an architect that we could find who could design us a really interesting Spanish style house? And through that process, she found James Osborne Craig. So he designed this house for them. It's called Casa Santa Cruz. And this is also a really important uh, house in Santa Barbara because of the effect it had on the Hoffmans, particularly Bernard Hoffman and his vision for what would become Santa Barbara. Well, all during this time, while the Hoffmans were here, they become, had become friends with the De La Guerra family. They had taken Spanish lessons from them. They got to know them really well. And in 1921, Bernard Hoffman convinced the family uh, to let him buy the Casa de la Guerra so that he could restore it and turn it into a historic building in Santa Barbara, a historic landmark. 
And he did, and he used James Osborne Craig as the architect because not only had he designed his house for Bernard, but he had worked on the Mission Santa Inez and really knew how to do historic uh, buildings in Santa Barbara. Well, the next year, Pearl Chase and Bernard Hoffman helped create a plans and planting committee within the Community Arts Association uh, to encourage city beautification. And uh, Pearl uh, Chase was really interested in planting trees. And so she got interested in planting uh, along the beach as well as along the, the streets. And this is why we have big palm trees down on the beach. And she started getting involved in saving a lot of historic adobes, including this one, which is at the Historical Museum. Uh, and through the Plans and Planting Committee, they started to use their social influence to promote the whole idea that that Santa Barbara should really start to look like a picturesque Spanish village. Let's get rid of the Victorian style, which nobody likes, and, and go to a new style like this. So this is another building right on De La Guerra Street, and this is kind of the concept they were pushing. Not a really elaborate style like, the, like you would have seen at Balboa Park in San Diego, but a really affordable, comfortable, casual, picturesque type of style like you see in the rural areas of southern Spain that we all know as Andalusia. Well, that same year, Bernard Hoffman asked James Osborne Craig to design an Andalusian style village center right next to the Casa de la Guerra in what had been the backyard of the Casa de la Guerra. Well, he could do this because he had bought the Casa and he now owned the land. And he wanted to take advantage of the fact that the Casa de la Guerra was a historic landmark and a center of, of social life in town to build his retail project right next to it. Well, this turned out to be one of the uh, first mixed use retail projects ever built in the United States, way before shopping centers were, were, had become popular. And this was very successful in Santa Barbara too. And people like to come to this cute little village center and, and have lunch and have dinner. And this was a popular watering hole for all the leaders of Santa Barbara well up until uh, through the 1980s and 19, up until about the 1990s when the Paseo Nuevo kind of took over downtown. But this was very successful. Along with that same idea, he took the front yard of the Casa de la Guerra, which had been designated the Plaza de la Guerra, and he formed a citizens architectural advisory committee to figure out how to promote a, an Andalusian design for a new civic center in the Plaza de la Guerra. The problem with the Plaza de la Guerra is, was that the city had built a town hall in a Victorian style, a brick building that was incongruous with all these other new ideas right in the center of the Plaza de la Guerra in 1875. So it was in the way. But the good thing was just like the courthouse, it was too small for the, the growing city government and it was falling apart. And the city was thinking about building a new building right at the, in, the, in place of the old building. But Bernard Hoffman uh, and his Citizens Advisory Committee talked the city into moving the city hall out of the center of the plaza and over to the side of the plaza and designing it in the Andalusian style of Southern Spain. So this is the city hall that got built on one side of the plaza. And then the Casa de la Guerra was on another side of the plaza. And then this citizens group uh, convinced the editor of the new Santa Barbara News Press to build a new headquarters building on the third side of the plaza. And that's why the Santa Barbara News Press building is there. And to design that building in the Andalusian style. So they would have three major buildings right on the Plaza de la Guerra that would help define the shape of the plaza and the plaza could be an open space just like the plazas in the town squares in southern Spain and you could have big community events there. Well there's only one problem they ran into an issue where there were several retail shop landowners on State Street that blocked the uh, direct connection between the De La Guerra Plaza and State Street. And it's really kind of a shame that that happened, that they just would not give up their properties. And so those properties are still there today. And because of that, there's no real direct connection between the most important street in town and the most important place in town. And uh, so unlike uh, Spanish villages where the main street goes right down to the central plaza, here the main street kind of bypasses. 
but the city is kind of aware of this. It, and the result is that it's really hard for people to go into the plaza. There's no reason to go in there. But the city's working on this, and hopefully they'll come up with some good ideas that will maybe solve that problem. But that's what happened. Well, over the next several years, Bernard Hoffman and other leading citizens managed to block several attempts by outside developers to create a waterfront retail project right on the beach. And uh, this was a, uh, a big concern. So they talked uh, a number of wealthy people in Santa Barbara to buy up all the available private land on East Beach to block anybody else from purchasing any land so that they would not be able to do any private projects right on the beach. And then they held this land until the city could actually pass a bond issue and buy the land and keep it uh, for public use, open for public use on, under the ownership of the city. Now, this was one of the four recommendations by the city beautiful expert, Charles Robinson, save the waterfront. So they saved the waterfront with this activity. Then previously, should have mentioned this. Okay. I found this on the web for beautiful expert, Charles Robinson, save the waterfront. Oh. Uh, uh, I'm going back here, let's see. Yep. So here, when, when, when um, the Hoffmans restored this, the uh, Casa de la Guerra, they fulfilled the second uh, recommendation, which was to treat uh, the mission and the Casa de la Guerra as important landmarks in the city. And then they started using this idea, as I said, to promote this whole Andalusian design. And then they asked uh, George Washington Smith to design a unified architectural concept for State Street all up and down straight State Street that would link the center of town, the Costa de la Guerra and the Plaza de la Guerra with the uh, beach and with the courthouse or with the, with the mission. So this was the fourth recommendation by Charles Robinson and all these things became really important in the design of the architecture uh, uh, and the uh, Spanish image for Santa Barbara. As I just said, all of these things led to the idea that Santa Barbara should look like the picturesque Andalusian villages of southern Spain. Uh, Casares is a really cute village in western Spain up in the mountains, and Grazalama is a really cute village in central Spain, uh, just north of, uh, of Granada. And you can see uh, that uh, all these just variety of very simple, easy construction makes this really picturesque view. And then uh, they usually surround a, a really nice little town square in the center. Well, all of the stuff they'd been doing that I've been talking about really rapidly uh, uh, created the idea that, they, they, that the city should be transformed into this picturesque Spanish image. But this was all just being done by concerned citizens who had their own money and their own interest in this, but it didn't really have a legal framework for the city to enforce this idea. So uh, in 1923, the Plans and Planting Committee from the Citizens uh, or the Community Arts Association uh, encouraged the city to form a planning commission. This was a really unusual thing in those days. It was one of the very first planning commissions that was ever created in Santa Barbara or in, in the country and it was right here in Santa Barbara. Now every city and town and every county practically has a planning commission, but this was a real pioneering effort. Uh, that same year, they hired a city planner named Charles Cheney uh, from San Francisco to come down and write one of the very first zoning and building ordinances in, in California. And uh, this was a really unusual idea too. And of course it created a lot of uh, issues and concerns over individual property rights versus the common community good. But the whole idea was to get control of land uses so that you didn't have incompatible land uses next to each other and getting control of building construction and design so that you didn't have ticky tack buildings with buildings that were safe and well-built and, and good looking. Well, there was huge argument over this and it took nearly two years of debate to get the zoning and building ordinance passed but the city leaders were eventually able to prevail. And this ordinance got approved just one month before the 1925 earthquake hit on June 29th, 1925. So 
all of these things that I've just been talking about all occurred before the earthquake hit in 1925. Some people think that the earthquake hit and then Santa Barbara decided to change everything. Well, the decisions were already made to change everything. You can even see a building right in here, one building that already started to pick up on a new style. Uh, but the earthquake made it much easier to actually transform Santa Barbara because now instead of doing it one building at a time, they had a lot of buildings to deal with. And all of these things affected the design of what the courthouse should be. The courthouse was going to be one of the most important buildings in town. It needed to buy into this whole concept of turning Santa Barbara from a typical Victorian community into a really special, unusual, and attractive uh, Andalusian Spanish style of community that could attract people from all over. Uh, and they needed the courthouse to be the symbol, the new symbol of what had been the old heritage of Santa Barbara. So um, got a few minutes here. I'm gonna keep going for one more thing. That, that's sort of the background of what happened uh, and why the courthouse, why the community leaders uh, decided that the courthouse should be designed in the Andalusian style of Southern Spain rather than the classical Greek revival style symbolizing democracy. They wanted to have the courthouse be the symbol of the new Santa Barbara and the new image, which is exactly what happened. Uh, now, uh, I'm gonna do a little, make a few little extra comments here because the courthouse is, has, has become the most important building in Santa Barbara. It's the number one tourist attraction in Santa Barbara. People come here from all over the world. It's, the, it's still an operating courthouse uh, and, and it is really the symbol of Santa Barbara. But it's 90 years old. And we have all inherited a very, very special and beautiful building. And it belongs to all of us in the community. And it's really up to us, not just a few people uh, or, or even just letting the county government deal with it to be good stewards and shepherd this courthouse safely into the future. There are uh, three organizations that take care of the courthouse. Um, one of them is Santa Barbara County and they do all of the maintenance and all of the operational uh, activities of the courthouse. And they do some uh, repair work at the courthouse. Uh, they're actually getting ready to do a really major repair project uh, to uh, restore, replace all of the, uh, and repair all of the roof tiles on the roof to make sure that the roof will last another 90 years. Uh, there's another organization that's really important to the courthouse and that is the docent council. Uh, they are, as I said, know more than anybody else about the courthouse. And they, uh, they do a lot. They're really, really dedicated to the courthouse. And they're able to raise money through some of their uh, events and fundraisers. And they also make uh, a fair amount of money by selling souvenirs at the courthouse information booth, which is their responsibility to uh, operate. Uh, so every year they do uh, relatively small but important projects. And this picture is an example of one of those where in this case, they were restoring the uh, painting above the small door that goes into the courthouse clock tower. And this is a small door, but it's one of the most important and one of the most highly used entrances into the courthouse. They've done a bunch of other uh, small projects too. But the really big projects take a lot more effort and a lot more expertise. And that has fallen to the Courthouse Legacy Foundation, which Angelique was talking about in the beginning. And this uh, organization was founded in 2004 to, to uh, find the funds and find the expertise that could make really large projects possible. Uh, and it is a 501c3 organization, and it's dedicated to uh, conservation and restoration and preservation of, uh, of all things at the courthouse, including interior work and exterior work. So you've probably, many of you probably have heard about or have seen all the new re renovations to the mural room. That was a really major project that was very expensive. Uh, they also uh, worked on a project to completely replace the Spirit of the Oceans Fountain because it was made out of soft stand, sandstone and sandstone wears really quickly. Uh, we are currently working on uh, restoring the Great Arch, the most in, uh, important and interesting entrance into the um, 
courthouse. And it's also made out of this same soft sandstone and it has had uh, problems over the years and, and people have tried to uh, restore it in the past and did not do a very good job. So we have to fix all of that and then we have to restore this, um, the, the sandstone where it's corroded. So these are big jobs and it really needs community support uh, to get behind the courthouse and make sure that uh, it's paid attention to. The county, um, as you can imagine, never has enough budget to do anything other than just keep the uh, courthouse operating. So uh, to do these special restoration projects needs community support. And we just hope that you will uh, kind of spread the word based on what you've seen and learned today and what you're gonna learn next week and, and help us uh, raise awareness for this need. So, and you can get more information on the Courthouse Legacy Foundation, as uh, Angelique said, by uh, going to the website sbclf.org. Now that finishes today's talk. Uh, next week, we are going to talk about how the architects, so this week we talked about all the things that happened in the city and all the people that got involved in the city to come up with the idea that Santa Barbara should be transformed into the Spanish uh, Andalusian style. And next week, we're going to talk about how the architects created their design based on this Spanish Andalusian influence and why it's still important today. <laughs>